Hey, listen, this morning, I uh, am already feeling it, <laughs> but the title of the message as we put the first screen up here this morning is Finishing Well. You know, last week I had mentioned an old saying that goes, the days are long but the years are short. And you know, there's a lot of truth to that because every day, you and I, we prepare for the finish line. Amen? And really, it comes down to the law, a given of sowing and reaping. Everything we do every single day of our lives has consequences, has ramifications of how we will finish. So when I say the days are long, the years are short, this time, this life that we've been given by God Almighty goes by much quicker than we think. Starting strong is relatively easy. Early days, nothing to think about. 18-hour work days, six days a week, doing all of the things that we got done as we raised a family, as we did all of the activities. And starting strong in the beginning you did what you did. You, you got it done, okay? But continuing that way takes planning and preparation, especially for faithful Christians who want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Am I right? Romans chapter 2, verses 6 and 7 says this, who will render to every man according to his deeds to them who by, listen, patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. I also mentioned last week that it becomes more and more evident to me, maybe because of my age bracket, young as I am, okay, that since the game of life is usually won or lost in the second half, that there may not be a more important goal than to finish well. That is why I have a picture on the screen, if you can read it. It says, finishing well is not about results, but about faithfulness. Paul wrote in the second epistle to Timothy, chapter 4 and verse 7, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course, the race. I have kept the faith. However, may I say it this way? Significance and a well-lived life are not accidental. You hearing me? It's not accident that you live well. It's not accident that you choose to love well. It's not an accident that you choose to forgive. It's not an accident that you choose to submit to the Lord God Almighty. It's not an accident at all. 
And I want you to hear this. I want to take time this morning to explore with you what it means to finish well in all aspects of our daily lives. Marriage, school, families, work, social life, relationships, church, things that you hold as your top priorities. I want us to be able to take time and have reflection, have time to reflect on a question such as, what do I want to be remembered for? That's a deliberate pause. What do you want to be remembered for? What is and what will be your legacy? In the end, the question of was I faithful with the gifts? In the end, the question of was I faithful with the talents that God gave me? Was I faithful to my values? Was I faithful to my faith? Was I faithful to my family? All of these must be accounted for and we are responsible for them. Again, Finishing well is not about results, but about faithfulness. Now, don't misunderstand that statement. Results are very important. Results in getting the best grade you can in school is very important. Okay? Results in having a working, open communication between your spouse and in your family. Results like that are very important. But look at the parable that Jesus spoke in Matthew 25, where he talked about the five talents that he gave. The master, it says, gave to every man according to his several ability. In other words, he gave to three people, three men, five total talents. According to their ability, he gave one a certain amount, to another a certain amount, and to another the one. We know the story, and we see where two of the three gained results. They did. They invested, they did something with what was given to them. But in the end, it was all about faithfulness and how they finished. What did you do with your one talent, sir? Well, we again, know the parable. Well, I was afraid. I took it, dug it into the dirt, into the earth, I stuck it where nothing could get to it, just kind of under the ground. In the end, it's all about faithfulness. What did you do with your talents here? We read in Philippians 1 and verse 6, being confident of this very thing, that he which has begun a good work in you, will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. So, if we have this promise that He will perform, that He cannot fail, come on, that He has already provided and enabled us to do it, to live this life, to get through, then we, you and I, just 
need to bring ourselves into that plumb line alignment of the truth of God's holy word. Amen? You know, it's sad to think about many that have started well but stumbled as they neared the finish line. They had success in their careers, but they will be remembered, hear me, for their lack of virtue and or their failures rather than their life's work in ministry. That's just what happens. And brothers and sisters, that is not what we want for ourselves. Can I get an amen? Go to that next screen for me, please. So here's a few points that I took out of Hebrews chapter 12. First three verses. I put down four different things that can help us And I'll just lightly touch on these, but they'll help us in kind of just remembering some things on how you and I can finish well, okay? Number one, learn from those that surround you. Let's open our Bibles and let's just read Hebrews 12, the first three verses. I'll read it. Out loud, if you need a Bible, we do have some on the back uh, behind the audio booth. But Hebrews 12, verses 1 through 3, says this, Wherefore, seeing that we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Verse 2, looking unto Jesus, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Verse 3, for consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. This great cloud of witnesses is identified in chapter 11 of Hebrews. Because when it starts in chapter 12, verse 1, it says, wherefore... Well, what's that there for? Go back and read in chapter 11. It is so important for us to learn from others. Even the bad things. We can learn from things that don't go well. Am I right? But learning from others, surrounding ourselves with others, is going to help us to finish well. You see, faith has substance. It holds something. It is something. And by it, the Word says in 11, verse 1 of Hebrews, by it, the elders obtained a good report. By faith, they obtained, they worked, they achieved, they got it. That encourages us to know we can do the same. Okay? By faith, it says Abel offered a more excellent sacrifice. By faith, Enoch was translated. By faith, Noah moved with fear and prepared an ark to the saving of his house. By faith, Abraham obeyed. By faith, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Gideon, David, Samuel, come on, and more. 
And these, yes, they were renowned men and women of God from old. But there are mentors that surround you on a daily basis right here. Can I get an amen? Whether you see them on a daily basis or just weekly, you are supported and surrounded in prayer and love that sets an example and a high standard for living a clean and a holy, consecrated life before our Maker. I'll tell you this I'm a better husband, I'm a better father, I'm a better leader because of those of you that surround me right here. And I applaud you. Second point that I'll make here that will enable us to finish well is also found in that first verse of Hebrews chapter 12. It's run light. Run light. James 1 and 21 reminds us, Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. That just means the abundance of naughty, just being stinky. (laughs) And receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. You know, and Jesus said, that he could help us with that. We read it in Matthew 11, verses 28 through 30. Jesus, his word says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light go to that next screen here have you ever seen a picture of a yoke that they would place on a pair of oxen or as sometimes described in the bible beasts of burden look at the picture on the screen oftentimes not always, but oftentimes in an effort to train a younger ox, it would be where one side is made larger than the other. When a pair of oxen were used, a more mature, older, and larger ox would be placed on one side with a younger and a smaller ox that was in training placed on the other. The larger ox would carry the bulk of the weight while it helped to train the younger. You and I have been given the right amount of weight to handle so that we can lay aside the weight and the sin that could so easily take us off track. God made us so that we needed to have that support, that time of training so that we could learn of him just like we read in his word. Let's go back to that screen before again. When we talk about running light, we're talking about the exhortation of don't carry the weight that you don't need and were not meant to carry. Jesus Christ did a finished work on the cross. Can I get an amen? He did it. And he did it so that he could, because of his love for you and I, save us and give to us, enable us, empower us, so that we could live a life that was pleasing to him. And so that we could take any temptation. Remember, there's no temptation that's ever going to be in front of you that is going to take you out. Because the word says, 
He's made it possible for you to overcome it. So don't carry the weight that you don't need to be carrying. The sin, the things of the world, the thoughts, the anxiety, the fear, the trouble, even sickness. Don't carry it. Don't carry it. Because he has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Again, can I get an amen? Third point, run with patience. Again, found in Hebrews 12 in the verses that we read. Run with patience, perseverance, and grit help us overcome many of our obstacles. That's right, perseverance, endurance, grit, and courage are characteristics of people who have successful marriages, businesses, relationships. I don't know anyone finishing well who doesn't possess those traits that I just mentioned. Can I say this? Success has almost nothing to do with talent, but much more to do with a never give up attitude. Are you hearing me? That is what you call grit. 1 Corinthians 9 24 through 27 says, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that you may obtain. Now, stop a minute. Paul isn't saying that there's just one winner in here. He was using it as an example because just as today, athletic events, things that they saw, it was a good parallel to understanding that when you watch a race, there's just one person that wins the prize. And so he encourages us and says, you know that in a race, we're all running. We're all there, but one wins. One receives the crown. Listen, as it goes on here. And every man that striveth for the mastery, verse 25, and every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. They do it, those that are in the world, those that are running a natural race, they are doing it so that they can win a crown, a ribbon, a gold medal. We do it, we're running, so that, yeah, we can also win so that we can receive an incorruptible body, crown, rewards, heaven, salvation <laughs> in this life and to come. You hear me? Keep reading verse 26. I therefore so run not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. You see, Paul was saying something here. This is a race that we know that we are engaged in. And it's not a matter of, oh, devil on the left, boom, boom. Oh, devil on the right, oh, boom, boom. And you're flailing your arms around. Up, devil behind me. Up, up, up. This is uncertainty. You take the word that has been planted in you and written on your hearts so that as you need to win, as you need to overcome, you are running that race with certainty. You know I'm not just beating the air. Sure, the devil's on my left, the devil's on my right, the devil's on behind me all around because that's just the spiritual darkness that is present. But I have been made able to overcome. Promises 
of God's word. Listen more as Paul goes on. Verse 27, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Success in finishing well has much to do with a don't quit attitude. Just don't stop. Don't give up. That last half of the race sometimes gets a little bit harder. You have, have to pace yourself sometimes. You have to have wisdom to discern what you can or can't do. Again, I'm there. I'm with you. But we need to never, ever give up. Never quit. Keep that grit of the Holy Ghost power working in you. Amen? We also read in 1 Corinthians 15, 9 and 10. Paul says, For I am the least of the apostles, that am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. Deliberate pause. Listen. By the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. Amen? But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was before me and with me. You know, I may not have been the strongest in my track event in high school. And I may not have been the top performer in sales in my company. And I may not have been qualified even for what God has called me to do. But just like it says here, I labor the more. I labor harder because I want to be found faithful. That's what I am running for. That's what I see at the end. I see a finish line. And I'm not going to go to the right I'm not going to go to the left. I want to keep on that track. You know, all of Paul's patience, all of Paul's perseverance, all of Paul's faithfulness was attributed to the grace of God. He looked at his huge accountability knowing that by grace he was enabled. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. To fulfill that responsibility that he had. Just remember, the grace of God isn't for the excusing of our sloppiness or loose living. Nope. Grace is God in action for our good. Oh, I'll say that again. Grace is God in action for our good. And it says his grace is upon you. And Paul says very boldly, by grace, by the grace of God, I am who I am. Do you know who you are? Do you know what is inside of you? If you've got the Holy Ghost, do you know truly what you've got in God? That's, again, the grace of God on our lives. It's in action for us. Let's go to that next screen here. The 
the last point was fix your eyes on Jesus, the prize. You know, the prize for me goes back to the word faithful. That's what I want more than anything else, to remain faithful to God, my wife, to remain faithful to my family, my calling. The key to my being faithful is focusing on the foundation of my faith, which is trusting in Jesus. This is a simple but not easy decision. When I keep my eyes fixed on Jesus, things fall into place. I can handle the difficult circumstances life brings my way, but when I take my eyes off the prize, my focus becomes dim, and I can easily lose my way. At the top of the screen, these words are written. If your soul is healthy, no external circumstance can destroy your life. If your soul is unhealthy, no external circumstance can redeem your life. It's really about as simple as that. Go to that next screen. Summarizing, I've just lightly touched, nowhere even begun to do what justice truly can be served in the time that we have here. But we've touched on just four points that would help us all to finish well. One, learn from those that surround you. Two, run light. Three, run with patience. And four, fix your eyes on Jesus, the prize. However, in conclusion, if I would have to answer the question of what I personally thought was the most significant factor in my life that would enable me to finish well, I would say this. Are you ready? This is personal. This is what I guess at this point in my life, knowing that this is what the Spirit of God wants to drop into us right now. The most important, significant thing that I personally could do and will be doing, am doing, in order to finish well is this. To take time, daily time, of focused personal communion with God. The key verse that we started off today was found in the second epistle of Timothy 4 and 7. Reading this time from the Amplified Version, it says, I have fought the good fight and worthy and noble fight. I have finished the race I have kept the faith, firmly guarding the gospel against error. But if you would continue with me in that 2 Timothy 4 and read chapter or verse uh, 10, listen to what it says. For Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica. Now I bring this to light because at one point prior to this brother Demas' departure from the faith, Demas was an important part of the ministry. I'll chapter and verse it for you. Philemon 23 and 24. Listen to what it says. 
There salute thee, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, Marcus, Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas, my fellow laborers. First hmm. John 2 and 15 says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So you see that apparently the love of the world took Demas out. It's something that brings the sobriety to our reading this morning. Knowing that that race that you and I are engaged in has to be finished. We've got to finish well. Our desire to spend time in communion with the Lord is essential to finishing well. Psalm 42 and verse 1 says, As the heart of the deer panteth after the water brook, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? <laughs> Yeah, I wait for that time. Lord, when shall I come and appear before God? Psalm 27 and 4 says, One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord, and all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. And can I get very real here? I'm not just talking about having a dedicated time to read a devotional and read a couple chapters that you happen to open to in the Bible and say, oh, that's the Spirit leading me right there, that's it. And say a prayer found at the end of your devotional. Don't get me wrong. Stop. All of those things are absolutely and very helpful. Hear me? But I'm talking about a personal time of communion with God our Father. Obviously, we need a plan. Obviously, we need things to guide us through. Those are essential. They help us get the results we need. But we don't just open our Bible, point our finger at a passage of, of Scripture and say, this is my passage for today. It's got to be more than that. Communion with God is far, far more than a plan. Communion with God is meeting with Him. It is asking God, to speak to us. It is speaking to him as we read his word, as we interact with his word in prayer, as we pray over what God is saying to us in his word. We should be able to, even as we heard last week from Pastor Don, in a question that was asked of him, how do you you know, what's the one thing that helps you to, to grow? How do you, you know, I forget what, exactly what the question was. But the example that he gave was when I open up God's Word, I read it, and then I talk to the Lord. You could open up any part of the Word, write yourself into it. Open up Psalm 91 and read it, the first verse, and say, yes, Lord, I know and I thank you that you have prepared a secret place, a safety for me, that under the shadow, that you have a shadow, that you have a presence. Those are the things I'm talking about that we need to get real 
open up his word and start coming back to the Lord. Not just reading it quietly, silently, shutting it. Nope, I spent my three and a half minutes. Take the time and say, Lord, I believe your word. I thank you, Lord, that by your stripes. Lord, I can't even imagine what that must have felt like. God, I'm so thankful that you did what you did and took all of that for me. Because your word says it right here. God, you're so real to me. You're so real to me. I thank you that you did all of that so that I could be free from sin, free from sickness, free from disease. Hallelujah. We've got to have that time with God. But if we are to finish this race and to finish it well, we really must be honest with ourselves. Are we pursuing God well enough, strong enough to stand on the words found in Revelation 12 and verse 10? It says, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Verse 11, listen. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he has but a short time. Are we ready? You know, it's written that when the late evangelist Billy Graham was asked how he would like for his life to be remembered. His answer was, and I quote, I hope I will be remembered as someone who was faithful. Faithful to God. Faithful to the gospel of Jesus Christ and faithful to the calling God gave me not only as an evangelist, but as a husband, father, and friend. Goes on quoting, I'm sure I've failed in many ways, but I take comfort in Christ's promise of forgiveness. And I take comfort also in God's ability to take even our most imperfect efforts and use them for his glory. By the time you read this, I will be in heaven. And as I write this, I'm looking forward with great anticipation of the day when I will be in God's presence forever. I'm convinced that heaven is far more glorious than anything we can possibly imagine right now. And I look forward not only to its wonder and peace, but also to the joy of being reunited with those who have gone there before me, especially my dear wife, Ruth. The Bible says, now we see but a poor reflection that is in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face, 1 Corinthians 13 and 12. But I won't be in heaven because I've preached to large crowds or because I've tried to live a good life. I'll be in heaven for one reason. Many years ago, I put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ who died on the cross to make our forgiveness possible and rose again from the dead to give us eternal life. Do you know if you will go to heaven when you die? You can by committing your life to Jesus Christ today.
It's also written in Billy Graham's last will and testament. Please listen. Quote, I ask my children and grandchildren Start that again. I ask my children and grandchildren to maintain and defend at all hazards and at any cost of personal sacrifice the blessed doctrine of complete atonement through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ once offered, and through that alone, he wrote. I urge all of you to walk with the Lord in a life of separation from the world and to keep eternal values in view. And perhaps... Even more significantly, we can learn from what Graham said that he regretted the most. We don't often associate regrets with Billy Graham and his ministry, but prior to his death, he shared those things that brought him the most regret. Here, in his own words, are the three biggest regrets of Billy Graham's life and ministry. Although I have much to be grateful for, as I look back over my life, I also have many regrets. I have failed many times, and I would do many things differently. For one thing, I would speak less and study more, and I would spend more time with my family. When I look back over the schedule I kept 30 or 40 years ago, I am staggered by all the things we did and the engagements we kept. Sometimes we flitted from one part of the country to another, even from one continent to another in the course of only a few days. Were all those engagements necessary? Was I as discerning as I might have been about which ones to take and which to turn down? I doubt it. Every day I was absent from my family is gone forever. Although much of that travel was necessary, some of it was not. I would also spend more time in spiritual nurture, hear me now, seeking to grow closer to God so I could become more like Christ. I would spend more time in prayer, not just for myself, but for others. I would spend more time studying the Bible, oh come on, and meditating on its truth, not only for sermon preparation, but to apply its message to my life. It is far too easy for someone in my position to read the Bible only with an eye on a future sermon overlooking the message that God has for me through its pages. And I would give more attention to fellowship with other Christians who could teach me and encourage me and even rebuke me when necessary. About one thing I have absolutely no regrets, however, And that is my commitment many years ago to accept God's calling to serve him as an evangelist of the gospel of Christ. When Paul wrote his words in 2 Timothy 4 and 7, where he says, I have fought the good fight. I've run the course He was writing the last known words from prison. It was in the fall of that year, I think it was 67 A.D. Spring of 68 A.D., he was beheaded. Paul was writing 
his last words to Timothy, saying, hold on. Continue in the things that you have learned, is what he had said in 2 Timothy 3, verse 14 and 15. He said, hold on, dear son. Hold on, dear family. We are a church. We are a house that has learned through many challenges to love well. And we can do this. And I just thank God that his word is true. And that it's through his word that we can stand together and pray that as we leave this day, we can with confidence know that he has enabled us to live and to love well. Take time to make others know that love. Don't fail to keep a smile and to bring a smile to someone's face. I know that we do that well here. But there are others out in the world that you will see as you go forth now from this time in your next journey and in your next part of life, however long that will be, live it well. Let's finish well. Amen? Let's rise to our feet. Lord, we thank you for the simplicity of your word. We thank you, Lord, for the truth of your word. And if there's anybody in here today that needs that touch of healing, a refreshing of the Holy Ghost, needs salvation. If you don't know the one that truly has enabled you and I to be free, then today's the day to just stop, come forward, and let it happen.